Hello students. Today we are going to study about Mauryan Empire. And in our previous class we had studied about administration. Where we had studied about central administration and the provincial administration. And even district administration also. Today we are going to continue about administration and we will see about administration of cities. So here um, administration of cities you can see that the head of the city was called as Nagar Adhyaksha. Then according to Megasthenes it is said that the capital city of Mauryan Empire Pataliputra it was looked after by 30 members committee. Okay. So next is that revenue system. So in revenue system, land revenue was the main source of income. Land, the main sources of income is land revenue. So it was collected like a one sixth to one fourth of produced. Okay, agricultural produced was collected. And there were two types of taxes. Two types of taxes were there. That is Bali and Baga. Okay, two types of taxes, Bali and Baga. So about Bali, it is written in one of the Ashoka's edicts. So Bali means it is religious tributaries so Bali means religious tributaries and according to Vincent Smith and Shama Shastri Baga is the tax which is collected on the agricultural products then apart from these two types of taxes there were other taxes collected like uh, toll tax was there then taxes were collected on liquor shops and gambling houses and even tax were collected on the products which was taken from the forest and even mines. And all these taxes they were making use for the benefit of the people. Like the state provided various facilities like roads, irrigations, hospitals and met other expenses of the state through these taxes. Next point is that the spy system. Chandragupta Maurya had wide network of spy system in his empire. So he had appointed a spy on other spy. And even more people were appointed so that he was getting more information uh, about any important matters. So even Ashoka also continued the same and uh, he used to disguise himself and used to move in his uh, state okay, to find out the more information. Next one of the important point is about military administration. So Chandragupta Maurya he had maintained a huge army which was having infantry, cavalry, elephants and chariots. All these things were there in his huge army. So according to Megasthenes, so Megasthenes he was a Greek ambassador who had visited Mauryan Empire in the time of Chandragupta Maurya and uh, in his book called Indica he has told that uh, there were 6 lakh infantry, 6 lakh infantry were there, then 30,000 cavalry were there and 9,000 elephants were there and from the other sources we are getting information like 8,000 chariots also were there. Okay. So even, even the weapons like bows, arrows, shields, swords, all these things were there as a weapons in the 
military so the whole army it was controlled by 30 members uh, committee and the soldiers they were recruited by the king also and the soldiers they were getting the paid salaries in cash and the Mauryan kings had built big big forts for the security and for the safety purpose. So next we'll see about Ashoka's Dhamma. Next we'll see about Ashoka's Dhamma. Ashoka's Dhamma. So here children, after Kalinga war, Ashoka, he became like people's king. He embraced mm -hmm. Buddhism and um, he did not impose Buddhism on his subjects. Okay. Even though he had embraced Buddhism, he did not force anyone to um, practice Buddhism here. So Dhamma was based on unifying principles of all religions of the world. Okay. So Dhamma means it is unifying all religions of the world. According to Ashoka's edict, Dhamma is not a religion or a religious system. Okay. So what it is, it is a moral law or a, like a common code of conduct or a ethical order. Okay, it is not a religion at all. Dhamma is not a religion at all. It is like a common meeting place of all the religions. Okay, so that's why it is said that Dhamma, you can see it is based on the unifying principles of all religions of the world. So next we'll see about the principles of Dhamma. What are the principles of Dhamma? So here first you can see that uh, respect for elders and love for children. Respect elders and love for children. First point is that uh, respect for elders and love for children. And second one is that ahimsa or non-violence. Ahimsa or non-violence. Third one is that good deeds or good karma would give happiness to the man in his next birth. Okay. Good deeds or good Karma will give happiness in his next birth. Okay. So that is the main point in Buddhism, isn't it? So what all karma we do now? So that we'll get in our next birth. Next point is that he taught people to respect the all 
religions okay respect all religions here you can see that even though ashoka he embraced buddhism he did not force any of his subjects to convert into buddhism isn't it so that is a, a good example here so he taught people to respect all the religions and the next point is that he disapproved empty rituals okay he was against to empty rituals he was against to empty rituals or he disapproved the empty rituals here next we'll see the impact of dhamma or ashoka's imperial policy impact of dhamma so in impact of dhamma or ashoka's moral policy you can say that first point is religious unity first point is religious unity so here children in religious unity you can see that he introduced a policy of religious tolerance okay so in this you can see all the religions were allowed to live okay they were not forced to, to convert into any other religion so all type of religions were there in his empire okay so that shows there was a religious tolerance next is that moral values so here in moral values you can see that the influence of dhamma people they started living in a moral life okay they were they started to live in a very happily they started to live that is after the um, introduction of uh, dhamma people they started to live very happily and the uh, next point you can see end of crimes so here the policy of ahimsa so it also ended the crimes here so crimes like uh, theft or um, killing others so all sorts of criminal activities came to an end in the end of crimes and the last point is that public welfare so here children in public welfare you can see with the policy of conquest and war with the policy of conquest and war this came to an end that is before embracing buddhism ashoka had the policy of conquest and war that is conquesting more places through war so now this came to an end now so ashoka he used dhamma for the um welfare of the people here okay so this helped many officers to undertake welfare activities for the public so through various schemes they started to construct like uh, hospitals then um, uh, good roads were made and either side of the roads they planted the trees which were bearing the fruits okay then rest houses so like there so many welfare activities were made so as a result the state got prosperity and this helped the people to lead a peaceful life so students today we are came to the end of this chapter so i hope everyone are clear with this topic so thank you children Have a nice day.